Namaste, Maria. Thank Namaste. You. <laughs> thank you so much for joining me today. Um, and thank you for agreeing to do this interview uh, for my uh, podcast, the Videshi Desi, which is all about uh, foreign women who dedicate their lives to Indian arts and then do whatever it takes to, to promote the art in uh, their home country and around the world. So uh, Maria is a beautiful Odissi dancer from uh, Peru. And uh, I'm so excited to hear about your story uh, today, uh, Maria. I don't know anything, so it's gonna be a complete surprise. And I think that is also a, a, a way to make things more interesting. So uh, Maria, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, you are now in Peru. Uh, yeah. And uh, I would like to know, um, how was your life before India? Oh, before India, yes. Um, of course, I was living with my parents. Um, uh, I was very, very young. I moved to India very, very young. But uh, my whole life, I have been training uh, martial arts and uh, Western classical music. In fact, uh, before leave, right before leaving to India, I was at the university studying piano, Western classical music. And, and every time I used to see something coming from India, my heart was just like full of excitement. And I really wanted to know about the culture. In my family, we used to read about different philosophies uh, not only Hinduism, but of course Hinduism was part of it, but Taoism, Buddhism, and other other kinds of philosophies. So somehow I was um, I was having a broad mind about different things. But whenever it comes to Hinduism, India, that was what I wanted to do. Just I I didn't know how to do. Then uh, for the first time I saw. Um, Indian classical dance through a video of a friend and it was my guru now Guru Sujata Mohapatra's video so when I saw it I just was like oh wow like I need to do this because it's so beautiful and it's like for me I saw it like a it involves music, which was what I was studying, but also the movements, the poetry, everything. But there was nowhere to really study that in my country. And so, were you already studying dance? Like, did you already have a dance background? I would say I had more of a martial arts background, even I did some capoeira and that kind of thing. But... Uh, I remember also I had uh, visited uh, the Hare Krishna community here because probably they were the only people who had some more knowledge about India. And there, there were like a group of devotees who used to kind of dance, I would say. And I kind of joined that kind of classes, but uh, they also really hadn't so it was more like what they saw from the videos. Maybe one of them was in India at some point, but not really, not really a, a proper background in dance. There was, mm -hmm. yeah. And so, um, what then made you leave Peru and go to India? And uh, tell us how that all came about. How did you prepare? Like, how did you get to India? And what did you do to get there? It was amazing, like a miracle for me, because uh, see, my family and I are Satya Sai Baba devotees. And uh, how did that happen? Oh, it's like insane. Like uh, my dad uh, always likes to learn about different things. And somehow he was in a different city in Lima. We, we don't live in Lima, but he was in the capital alone and somehow he had some friends who took them there and what attracts attracted him uh, from um, 
this community of Sai Baba, first of all, because he didn't know who was Sai Baba, was the pajams, the music, because ah. he likes music. So he was like, oh, okay, this is really interesting. I really like the pajams and so and so. And so like that, he started to read also the books uh, that teach mostly about love all, serve all. And it's like very much, um, uh, there is only one religion and that's love. <laughs> and kind of, mm. It's something like that, no? So because of that, uh, he brought this back home, I would say to whatever he, he experienced in Lima, the Sai Center, he brought it here. And over here, we found out that there were some people who, who also were following knew, Sai Baba. Uh, and then uh, when I was 17, like, before, of course, I was a child and I was following what my parents was, uh, were teaching me, right? But when I was 17, I really felt it in my heart. Like mm -hmm. uh, it was my um, soul's wish, I would say, to be able to meet Baba. But at the same time, um, I was mad about Indian dance. Like those two came together. But then what happened was that... Um, this happened when I was 17 or 18. I got an invitation to perform uh, with a symphonic orchestra in India for Sai Baba. And, wow. uh, and um, I waited like for a whole year for a confirmation. So to be honest, I thought I was not like they didn't choose me to participate because I was not getting answers. So I just, I was sad, but I was kind of like, okay, maybe it's not it. for me. Yes. Yeah. One day, I remember I was here on my own, at home, in, on my own, and I got an email because at that time we didn't have Facebook or anything. <laughs> so, and uh, they accepted me to participate. And I was like, wow, then, um, it was a hard decision for my parents because I was 19 then and um, wow. and then um, they decided to let me do it because they would be also renowned musicians from other places of the world and it would be like a really nice chance anyway so they said okay you're going but um, I was supposed to stay in India only for three months and do the concert and try to see India and so and so and so. So this is how I landed into India. I did the concert and all that. But um, the thing is that I got invited to a second concert and I was already there. And uh, the, uh, the, before leaving my country, I was at the university, I was, as I was telling you, and Somehow I managed to finish like a whole semester and final exams before leaving to India. So, okay, my parents agreed that I could stay for the second concert as well. And, uh, <laughs> and so it was. And um, during that time between the first concert and the second concert, one was in July, 2005 and the next in November. So uh, in that time, I met a lot of people in Puttaparthi, Prasanti Nilayam, Sati mm -hmm. Baba's place, lots of foreigners as well. So I didn't really feel the, um, the Indian culture as strong as later on. Mm. But um, okay, I did the second concert. And the thing is that I had to come back home. <laughs> yes. Didn't come back home. <laughs> <laughs> I I really like I really threw my ticket away. Wow. And, <laughs> yes. <laughs> because and it was an expensive one. <laughs> but uh, why I did that? Because I felt I was not done with India. And then I understood that if I go back, it would be really hard to come back again there. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's also very expensive from my country. So yeah, it's the other side like, of the planet. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Wow. So I was 19 and I, I was very lucky to have some older friends, also some Latin older friends who were staying there years. So they kind of... Uh, to like you under their wings. Me. Yeah. Yes, took care of you. Exactly. I, 
how to do the things and all that. But uh, because I was sure that I had to learn Odyssey somehow, I, I was sure. <laughs> so I applied to actually different schools, even Nritya Gram, even Kalakshetra I was thinking to do because I said, okay, it's, ne it's nearer to go to Kalakshetra anyway, if I cannot mm -hmm. do Nritya Gram, let's say. But um, on, when I had to go for a visa run, like the first time I had to go, I went to Nepal, I remember. And from Nepal, I was thinking I should go to Orissa, just find uh, um, Sujatapa. Cool. Yes. Yeah, find her. I wanted Sujatapa, but I said I will be open to what it comes to me and so and so and so. On the way back to India, I, uh, I went to Orissa with a Japanese lady who I was lucky to have with me at that moment. And uh, somehow, through contacts, I landed at Masako Ono's house. <laughs> yes, and she, she was very nice actually with me and she took me to different schools. And, and uh, but she said, you go to Srijan, uh, if you want to go to Srijan, you go there and see what's happening. And I went there and those days, I remember Appa and Shibubai were not there yet. So Jatapa, they were touring, but the girls were really nice. And they told me, just come after a couple of days, they are coming back. So I did that. But when I entered, I remember this problem. When I entered Guru Kalucharam Mahapatra's house, it was like, this is it. I'm not going anywhere else. And, and uh, then when I had uh -huh. the chance to talk with uh, Shibubai and Appa, I told straight forward to Shibubai with my 19 years old or 20 maybe then, I need a letters or whatever it is for getting a student visa because I cannot uh, come and go. I cannot do that. It's very expensive for me. So. I need this and I want to stay here as long as it takes me for me to learn. <laughs> <laughs> I said so. <laughs> and then um, it was very interesting because he invited me. Then he said, well, okay, you join the summer workshop at Sudan and see how it goes for you. Then I experienced my very first summer in Orissa. Wow. <laughs> yes. That was in 2006. I will never forget. I the hostel room with the other girls who were coming for the summer workshop at that time it was packed <laughs> like even one year I remember it was like 40 people in one in the hostel room <laughs> and um, it, it was really tough because I was a total beginner but the speed at Srijan for example is really like ta -ta -ta -ta. in the morning you have class with everyone then uh, Shibubai assigned me another girl, Vandana, uh, to teach me the beginning because I was like on zero. Little baby. <laughs> totally. <laughs> and then uh, I had to practice on my own. Then I was joining the kids class and then Sujatapa was uh, correcting me in the afternoon. So I was basically the whole day dancing fully. And, fully uh, immersed in the culture. Absolutely. Like, I would say like, my experience in India during Puta Party time, it was completely different than how it was in Orissa. Of course. It's a completely different Different, scenario. different worlds, yeah, different exactly. worlds. Exactly. I can't imagine Orissa at that time. It must have still been very tribal, very, Absolutely. very, uh, very different from what it is today. <laughs> yes. Wow. Yes, it was. It was, and I remember, like, because I had to contact my parents and everything, I had to go to find a cyber cafe in the middle of the nowhere. <laughs> it was hard, <laughs> a bit hard, but, but sometimes also I was reaching the cyber cafe and there was power cut. <laughs> so it was. I mean, really even to make a phone me. call during that time, it was so difficult. So difficult. It wow. was hard. But, I mean, Sujan oh, wasn't even on the map, on the world map during that era. So exactly, it was so it, you got you got to experience the uh, probably some very beautiful aspects of Sujan, which probably today it's not there anymore. 
Yes, I would wow, say so. Wonderful. That is that is well, such a beautiful encounter that you. Yes. It's beautiful. It was because Guruji died, like passed away in 2004, I, I believe. Mm -hmm. So I, I reached um, Surijan in 2006 and I could still feel the vibe at home of Guruji. Like even the students who were at the summer workshop had the chance to be with Guruji. And uh, there was this sense of keeping the legacy and alive. everyone was, yes, keeping the legacy alive. And uh, everyone was working really hard towards that. And uh, I, I remember Sujatapa being very young. And just when I used to watch her in the classroom, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> and she would practice hours and hours too, and then teach and, uh, and all that. So it was like, I was just happy to stand behind her all the time. <laughs> I was just there like, <laughs> like a little puppet. <laughs> so how many years were you there, this first initial stage of your life? How many years did you stay in Orissa? So, uh, so I, had, uh -huh, I had these four months of trial and the last day, Shibubai gave me the letters to apply for the visa. So I got those letters. I came back to my country after that. So it was like, Totally in India, it was one year and a half already. Mm -hmm. And when I got the letters and um, I came back to Peru. And when I was trying to make my student visa, nobody was believing me that I was applying for a student visa to study dance <laughs> or this year. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, even at the embassy, like uh, the consul made me show whatever I learned during those four months, which was not, it was a lot for a beginner, but I was feeling shy to, to show it anyway. So he saw that I was so mad about it. He contacted Shibubai and, okay. and uh, so it was like, okay, she really wants to do this. I'm like, yes. And then uh, he gave me the visa <laughs> finally. And when I returned to India, um, I was a bit happier because there was uh, at Srijan one more girl, one more foreign girl, Amanda. I don't know if you met her. Amanda Roy, yes, I know yes, her. Yes, Amanda was in the hostel room and I was like, I know her, I know her. Oh, who are you? <laughs> and then uh, and then we became friends, like really close friends through the years. But I got first, I got like a four year, five years student visa or so, four or five years student visa. And then I renew it one more time after that time, like three years or something like that. So I like, I spend it around seven years in Orissa, but of course, sometimes I was taking holidays to go to put a party to my country every three years I was coming. <laughs> wow. So, like, and after that, I have been still going to India, but on tourist visa only. Mm -hmm. So the other times I had to run out from India more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and I was not staying at Sweden all the time. Obviously, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. so that is really impressive. I'm <laughs> really, uh, it's just amazing how you had that innate uh certainty that this is what you're going to do and these are the people that you're going to study with and this is just what i'm going to do for the next seven years of my life <laughs> no matter no matter what anyone tells me that's quite amazing so um i mean i landed in orissa in 2008 and already i found it so difficult as a white woman navigating orissa i mean navigating Bhubaneswar. and so um i would love to hear how was it for you i mean obviously you had uh, a family that you were with like a very strong uh, uh well-known family in orissa that were probably taking care of you on that aspect but i'd love to know uh, as a as a foreign uh, woman young girl living in orissa how was the, what were the challenges that you faced uh, during those years Ooh. as a foreign woman? I would love for you to be as real as possible because I think it's really important that people understand what it took for someone like you to give up your life in Peru, which is on the other side of the planet, and live in India as a single woman. 
studying dance, especially in that era? Yeah, in that era. Yeah, actually, I have been very lucky in the sense that, um, as you said, the family, not only Mohapatra family, but the girls at Srijan were very, very, very nice girls. And they kind of like conducted me through the new ways of living and, and they helped me to adjust to it, like how to live with an Oriya family. Like for me, of course, there was a cultural shock anyway. Uh, you know, uh, we South American people sometimes are very like, ah, and bubbly and happy and we like to talk uh, with men or women. We don't really- Open. Yes, yeah. we are really open like that. But I remember I had to change a little bit my way of expressing more, like less smiley and more like contrived. Yes, because uh, I was explained that it was uh, not such a good idea for a young girl to be so open, especially with men, right? Mm -hmm. Especially with men. So and then, yeah, I was I became very much conscious about it. And I tried my best to follow the what I was told to. Uh, but also, I remember like people uh, used to look at me weird because uh, at that time we just had Pizza Hut or Coffee Day, something like that. And I would go on my own. And that was so weird for them that a woman so young would be going on her own to, to sit and have a coffee by herself or something like that. So, but I was lucky that uh, I had Amanda for most parts of it. So I had this balance of like West as well. Mm -hmm. And I could share those things too. To adjust, for example, to food, to the nutrition, right? And uh, there are things that are quite easily available in my country, like quinoa, let's say, it, which just like it grows here like normal. And, and, uh, and um, olive oil, these kind of things that are nutritious yeah. for you. And then I had to really, because I was staying in the hostel room I, at the times where it would, when it was served. And sometimes I well, like, our breakfast would be like chow mein or like uh, some fried thing, yeah, <laughs> not so very healthy, I would say, right? Yeah. And then uh, you have the lunch, which is mostly rice and dal with little veggies. And in the night we would have like dinner almost at midnight sometimes. And um, you are so hungry before that. So then you go to search for a snack and you don't find anything else but these small stores that you probably have seen where you get like uh, biscuits so, or like... Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> but then, uh, okay, sometimes we were eating those things. But of course, when we discovered Pani Puri, and <laughs> that was it. <laughs> we used to have those in between the meals. But I was understanding it was not healthy for me to, to keep up like that. My body was not used to it just. So mm -hmm. I tried to... I try to buy for myself more veggies and eat more salad or things like that, or try to get more paneer mm -hmm. and these kind of things. But uh, I was not feeling, you know, it's like you practice so many hours, then you eat like crazy, but you don't feel you ate anything. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there was no possible, like it was not possible to buy any other kind of nutritious supplement or so almost. of course yeah yes so and there was no amazon like to order it online of course there was nothing at that <laughs> <Yeah>. time <laughs> nothing at that time so i did what i could but i knew like i know i know even till now that my health like the deter was deteriorating that way so that's why sometimes i used to take gaps and go where there was a little bit more of western westerners because on those places you have other things available and mm -hmm. then I just recharge myself and so and so but you kind of learn things, along the way exactly. every day you start learning like what is it the things that you can get that can you know 
Desde o campo, fire, yes. more nutrition or more well-being, yes, I know. More well-being, exactly. More Then, well-being. Uh, Uh, what was also a little bit hard having a student visa, like for the first year as, as a young girl alone, was having to find this uh, foreign registration office because nobody knew where it was really. <laughs> I remember just being in an auto rickshaw and uh, thank God Sridan helped me with it. <laughs> But it was like do this uh, paperwork at that time on the, my first year especially. And I was like running all around Bhubanesh while searching the, <laughs> searching the office until somehow somebody knew and I got there <laughs> and uh, it was so weird. And um, some really hard things I believe that many of us foreign girls have experienced. It's a little bit of like harassment as well. Like mm-hmm. uh, I remember a few times One that I really clearly remember was like Shivaratri night. All of us girls were going to like to visit the temples, right? The temples in the night. And there was a lot of people, but few of us really felt that we had been touched inappropriately a few couple of times. And you just see such a crowd. You don't know like who was. I just remember walking with my hand back, like on my back wow. and ready to squeeze someone else or like in the nights not even in the nights like i remember even at four o'clock five o'clock you just go to the store or something and somebody on the bike will come and just try to touch you or they touch you in fact and it's more painful or scary than anything because it's like so fast and you cannot do nothing yeah absolutely nothing so uh, i feel like um you always need to walk with the eyes wide open and just be a little bit ready and um, I find it always is the best to dress up like a local woman yes to be as yeah I also felt that when I was in Orissa in Orissa I had a phenomenon where I just had everyone that I would like I would go to the store and then I always had people stopping and wanting my phone number oh (laughs) Right? <laughs> it was the first strangest thing that happened to me like I'm just going to the store and I had people asking me the phone number and I just felt it so strange and then my teachers would say like no 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 don't give your phone don't number. give <laughs> yes. and I'm like why is everyone asking me for my phone number oh it's but, um, crazy but I experienced Once... yes To me, this is, you're talking about phone numbers. Like I remember a few times I go to recharge my mobile when finally we got a mobile. And um, like suddenly you get random calls after like from Odia men or Indian men itself. And they oh, just You know, that to... happened to me too. I was yes. like, how do these people get my, how are they calling me? And then I would get a random call in the school and then my guru would be thinking like, who are you speaking to? Who's this Indian yes. friend? And I'm like, no, I don't know any I of don't these know. people. <laughs> and they would, yes. you know, my, the teacher at the time would get so suspicious of me. And I'm like, I have no oh. idea who's calling me. <laughs> this is all very yeah. strange to me. <laughs> It's so, really a learning curve definitely it is for sure so i would love to know like now today um how does your how do how does india how does the community like when did like first when did you start performing when did the school like sirjan allow you to start perform and today how does the indian community how does the dance community how do even your gurus support you with performances and support you with your dance life So yeah, I started performing, actually, I was very lucky. I started studying in 2006. I was already performing in end, end of 2007, I remember. And I did it in the, at that time it was like more like the national festival. So there were definitely many more dancer, experienced dancers than me. <laughs> But um, what I felt is like, especially like I would say that first three three four years I was in Orissa they have they have been the most important years Mm -hmm. because uh, I got uh, my grounding but also the most amazing experiences uh, as a performer Um, like 
one day you are a beginner and the next day your teachers are allowing you to perform on a big stage and they give their name and all, all that and it's a lot of it's a lot of responsibility mm -hmm. of course uh, but i feel on those three four years the first three four years the amount of training we used to have it was like unbelievable it never has repeated like that again of mm. course we always have good quality of training but those years were like amazing and we were very few foreigners also mm -hmm. i would say so most of the years were amanda and me but in between there were people coming and uh, staying also for some longer periods of time shorter periods of time but it was building like a community of dancers from all around the world anyway. Like wow. December and the whole winter, I would say, was the time where all the dancers from around the world who were students of Sridhan, I would say, they are coming together and performing and getting to know each other. And I have built up the most amazing friendships from different wow. parts of the world who are still my friends. And I, for me, this is something that... Uh, it's priceless just wow. priceless like uh, the the relationship you built with the girls who are going through the same that you are experiencing mm -hmm. with all the hardships and good moments it's like it's a bond it creates a bond that also i think this bond doesn't allow you to feel better or worse than anyone it's just like we are all learning and we are all like on the same thing together as we were talking before yeah. so i like i like very much this feeling whenever i go somewhere let's say to russia because i have been there before many times and i had these amazing friends who are still my friends and then they say let's perform and you're like yes let's perform okay let's mm -hmm. do this okay sure let's do this and like this in a few places right like Beautiful. um even you, like you had a, an amazing sisterhood a, a, a yes. beautiful sisterhood was built exactly uh, it during your training years and so that has that is still continues still continues this is the most that amazing is. thing really and okay. of course um i have kind of grown up in india like from 19 years old like my gurus have seen me since like let's say my early 20s till now but I have been in India till last year, most of the time. Mm -hmm. So, so they have so seen really me. really witnessed you. Grow. Absolutely. My grow, like also in my personal life, they have seen me in different uh, aspects until now. Wow. Like, it's yeah. very, very, very powerful. Like, like, for example, with Pritisha, with uh, my, my guru's daughter, the bond is very unique because I have seen her when she was a baby, almost like she was six years old. And I have played with her like through all the years. I have seen her grown. And the last time I saw her personally, it was like, wow, you have grown up so much. And I, I love to see that. It's like she's a beautiful <laughs> young girl right now. During the pandemic, we used to call each other sometime. How are you doing? <laughs> and things <laughs> like that. So it's like much more than just your teachers. It's your yeah, like family. family yeah so let uh, i would love for you to share like what is it that you learned in your odc journey like what did odc cultivate in you as a dancer and as a woman as a human as and a human. and joining that question is also like what has india cultivated in you as a woman and in india so what have what were the most important lessons that you've learned that you think could be really valuable for any woman who would still today like to go travel to India to learn dance or even at their home learn dance, you know, like what is it that you think is really important that you've learned? I, I have learned so much actually, but I would say like to trust myself fully, like I am capable of doing things even when it doesn't seem to <laughs> or like because in India, you know, sometimes 
it's not common that somebody will say, oh, you're an awesome dancer. Like your teachers will tell you you're a great dancer or like you're doing great. No, you need to trust yourself and need to trust your guru. And um, courage, you need to have courage to take decisions and determination. But be, what is hard, in fact, is not to start sometimes. Many people sometimes enjoy starting and, and it's something new and so and so but what it is hard is to sustain to keep and mm, uh, because so you go you go through so many hardships sometimes that at moments it really makes you feel that uh, okay why am I doing this do I need to be doing this much of sacrifices <laughs> really <laughs> or or like where am I going I cannot see it right now so I feel like we need to have faith and trust and courage on our like trust ourselves that we it's like our path and somehow maybe not now you cannot see it but it will come a time that you will see the fruits of what you are doing yeah and um, because Odyssey also, dance a DC dance is such a difficult form of practice. I mean, it's so difficult in the body. Technically, it's so elaborate and, yes. um, and very demanding. But I exactly. feel that that training, um, first of all, when you're in it, 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 there's this power that has been cultivated in you right like physically and then mentally yes, and mentally and then like all the hardships of that practice kind of give you tools to then live life uh, i wanted to share one more thing i also mm. have learned self-compassion but not on the beginning of the year i, I am mm. talking about now after like let's say since two years back, I feel this because I have pushed so hard my body. I have pushed so hard my everything to just um, keep the standard of my gurus and so and so and so. And then you realize that sometimes pushing too hard can be also harming you in some way, like your physical mm -hmm. body has limits anyway. Your soul <laughs> doesn't. Your soul is powerful, but sometimes your physical body is exposed to so much stress, as you said, like the challenge of the technique and the, 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 the hardship of living in India itself, it's a challenge by itself. So it's like um, you learn to balance and, and uh, I would say like try different ways to keep your, your practice without being so rude to yourself sometimes mm. like yeah. like that and to me to reach that point has costed me like hormonal problems um adrenal fatigue <laughs> and um, weak muscles and all kinds of things that you can imagine so i taught you self-care yes self-care is very self important and rest something we forget about that a lot <laughs> not, not everyone some people need the fire to start and keep it and some people need to learn to rest and relax <laughs> and just take care after yourself <laughs> mm -hmm. um oh another point is like what do you think women who want to travel to india should know before traveling, think, before to study ODC or any classical Indian dance or to go to Orissa, like, um, what do you think women should really know before studying an art and going to India to study? I think, um, I would say, first of all, it's very good if uh, people like these girls have the chance to talk with other people like us, let's say, who have mm -hmm. experience because uh, we would tell them things uh, from our experience not to discourage them just to, to make them aware of things and the challenges but they should know that it's really good to follow a bit the culture and the tradition to feel safe that uh, it's it's better um, 
as a woman alone traveling, it's better to, to, to dress up as they do, to behave a bit as they do, as the ladies from there they do. And to have local friends is very good, but still you need to keep some distance with the males, with the people you don't know anyway, mm -hmm. it's like that. And uh, you really have to be open from your mind <laughs> to different things that you probably have never experienced in your country. So, uh, but most of all, I think that they should never stop to do something out of fear. <laughs> mm. Yeah, resilience. Yes. A DC resilience. really teaches uh, you resilience. resilience. India yes. teaches you resilience. Absolutely. <laughs> so just, you just be open and go with the flow a bit of in what India has to offer. <laughs> A hundred percent. Yeah. So um, now you're in Peru. How do you keep up with your practice back at home now? Yeah, it's been a challenge because I have been like, I have been uh, not only in Peru, I was uh, in Brazil when the lockdown started. Oh, wow. And I, I was repatriated and I was in another city in Lima like for five, six months until I was able to come home so the challenge is like what I do what it has served me really when I have been not able to properly stamp my feet or so I have just what I have learned in sports science because this is what I did like to less like a tool for my self-care to train the muscles in such a way that they are ready to be used as a dancer Mm -hmm. and uh, you keep them toned accordingly like for our dance mm -hmm. like uh, not only the muscles that we use as dancers but also the supportive muscles so in that way you are always kind of like feet like we do like you, you, you we I have I have kind of like discovered a way like to to blend my OTC practice with my sports science um, certification and knowledge that I have met and I have found out that it's possible for us dancers to, to have a routine that doesn't require all the time um, to stamp our feet and have a place to dance, okay. but to be fit. But I also use a lot of visualizations when I am not able to do my practice properly like I visualize my choreographies and try to to work on other aspects of the dance itself until I am able to stamp my feet again <laughs> <laughs> yes but now that I am here in my country in in my home place I am free to sustain my practice as normal oh that's wonderful yes <laughs> And uh, yeah. how um, do you have students in Peru? Are there people interested in learning ODC with you? How is the scene there right now? The, the scene here, it's, it's hard for artists everywhere, but mm -hmm. uh, I would say because of the economy of our country, it's kind of not the best. People is interested, but still they are like, not ready to like do the, the extra expenses yes make the commitment until i believe now it will start again and i have i have been lucky enough that whenever i have come to peru before i have been able to do workshops or so and so and there was a nice response from people so now i would say that um those people would like to continue just I need to give them some time so they can yes. commit to it again. <laughs> I think the yeah. whole world is a bit like that right now. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Um, yeah. Okay, let me see. Uh, what message would you like to give people who would love to follow ODC? Or uh, is there anything you would like to add on to this, uh, to this talk that we've been having? I, I would say that, um, I think I said it before, but that yes. for me it's very essential. Don't stop yourself doing things out of fear. Just yes. try them and uh, enjoy the process, not 
the final result, but the mm -hmm. process of like learning something new, especially if like we're talking about learning Odyssey, learning, like enjoy the process of your body going through each step, through each new movement that you learn and don't, um, don't stress out if you're not capable to do it fast because mm -hmm. it's not possible just enjoy the process <laughs> enjoy the process <laughs> yes all right maria i don't think i have any more questions for you today um oh. yeah i want to say thank you so much for uh, taking your time to share with us a bit of your story it's so inspiring uh, to hear how you reached India and how you reached uh, ODC and uh, all I can say is I really wish you well in Peru and uh, I wish you so many blessings on your journey of dance and that it may flourish even more within you within your life and that inshallah I hope we can meet in India at some point yes that would be amazing <laughs> thank you so much to you this is a wonderful wonderful uh, idea that that you have mm. to share with the world <laughs> yeah thank you so much Maria yes all right so I see you next time yes yeah, see you okay. thank you bye bye <laughs> bye